sense objects. The whole of experience is divided into sense organs on the one side, sense objects on the other. The same nature evolves into sense organs on the one side, sense objects on the other. Same nature. So that subject is taken up here in every one of us. There is the sense organ and that comprehends, experiences sense objects. One is tied to the other and in this context they remain bound. Sense organs, sense objects, we become bound in this world of relativity. How to get rid of this? That is the subject that came in the last Sunday's discourse. And he said, this is death in the psychical sense of the term. We can get rid of this death. There is a death of death. That subject we read last week, including Shankara's commentary. The death of death. A wonderful idea. These are all changeable phenomena. I change, the world is changing, everything is changing. That's called death. But is there anything changeless in this world of change? That investigation takes you to this great area of experience, namely the infinite subject, the observer, the self. We are preparing the ground to that investigation. Whatever is visible, tangible, analyzable, we study first. From the known, we proceed to the unknown. The world is known. And what knows it? The sensory system. Senses collect data. And we study all about the world, including the senses. We can study the senses also. Our nervous system, which stimulates the senses, we can study. They all constitute the context of graha and atikraha, two technical terms Upanishad had used. And they said, in this context, it is death in the main constant change, change, change. No kind of changelessness you can find in this external world. Neither in the human system. Everything is subject to death. In the grasp of death, the language that is used. So the question came, can death cease? Is there anything deathless? Anything changeless? That is the most important question agitating the heart of man all through history. In the Upanishads, you have a treatment of this subject which is so refreshing, so rational and so convincing. The approach is something original. Nowhere else you will find this kind of approach. A little you will get, as I often said, in Plato's dialogues. And according to several writers, Plato and Socrates are highly indebted to the Upanishads. I have quoted that book, Message of Plato, where the writer, Englishman, says, you can't understand Plato without studying the Upanishads. So this particular subject is the original contribution of India in the Upanishads. Thereafter, it remained our consistent approach to the subject to the ultimate reality, from the known to the unknown, from the changing to the changeless. So we study first the human body. It has a sense organ. There are the sense objects. We experience, we enjoy, we suffer and we die away. But we have also a particular capacity in us to question all this. What is all this mad nonsense? Eating, drinking, dying away. Is there nothing real? Nothing permanent? Nothing eternal? That question also you can ask. You have that capacity. That question was asked in a consistent way by the great sages of the Upanishads. Answers they got have a tremendous quality of scientific precision. And many answers have been given in religions. Eschatological answers. Some heaven far away. 
an extra cosmic god sitting somewhere. All these answers were there. They will not satisfy the human's questioning mind. Here is an approach which can stand that questioning mind. Not only so, which invites such questioning mind. Nowhere in the world you will find a literature and a philosophy which invites questions, which is not afraid of questions, or rather, which is afraid of people not questioning. Those who are easy to believe any kind of folly, any kind of particular theory, operate afraid of such people. We want people who will question. Therefore, in this section, you are entering deeper and deeper into the subject of the permanent in the world of the impermanent, eternal in the midst of the changing. It is certainly not there in the world of experience, external experience. There everything is change, change, change. It is grasped by death as a language. But as Shankara said last Sunday we read, there is a death of death. Death can be killed or destroyed. How? By realizing what is deathless, what is immortal. And Upanishad is going to say, that is your true nature. But before saying that profound truth, it is taking us through all these various discussions of the world of day-to-day -day experience. Immediately we shall enter into this subject. My sense organs are knowing the world outside. This is graha, that is atigraha. Is it really the sense organs who is doing this thing? Are they really the experiencer or there is something else inside? That is the subject that is coming now. Sense organs are not the experiencer. They are only the instruments for experience. The energy of that experience comes from a deeper source. There is a principle of consciousness behind this graha and atikraha system. The principle of intelligence. That is what stimulates the sense organs to understand the nature of the sense objects and to grasp them. That subject is coming up here. There. But he said, everything is karma. In the end we discussed, saying, when a person dies, what remains of him? The answer came, karma. The effect of actions. These various actions we have done, they leave their impressions. They are some scars. They are called vasanas. They remain. That's what we carry to our next existence. This is the first idea. We don't carry anything else. All the wealth and power we have here, we have to leave behind. But one thing we carry, the result of our actions we carry. This comes from the understanding that these sense organs, which are externally called ear, eye, etc., internally they have a subtle existence. They constitute the sukshma sharira of every human being, the subtle body. Here is the gross body, behind which is the subtle body. That subtle body is a real man. This other is only a container. That subtle body continues carrying all these impressions, which gives it a particular tendency to find the expression in a future life. That is how karma is introduced here as an important element in human life. Every action produces an impression upon the human mind. It produces an impression on the world outside also. Whenever you dig somewhere, it has changed the ecology of the world outside. But there is another aspect of that work. It changes the ratio of forces within the worker. There you are creating a new set of asset or liability. It may be good, it may be bad. How does the mind accumulate these vasanas, samskaras? Then this language said, those who do good, they accumulate good samskaras. They do bad, they accumulate bad samskaras. And this will condition our re-manifestation in another life. Nothing else can explain it except this, your karma, which makes you go in a particular direction. Even within one's life, it is absolutely true. If you misbehave with your digestive system in our young age, 
you will pay for it by developing a bad system when you are older. This is karma. I have made it here. We can verify it within this life. That much is understood. Cause and effect are easily understandable within this human life. So there may be very subtle aspects which we may not understand at all. But by and large, we accept that the body and mind of a human being are being shaped by his own actions and thoughts and so one is causative of the other. That is karma. As the cause, so the result, so the effect. But we extend it beyond the human life of this physical body only because we discovered that this physical body is only a gross aspect of a subtle body which is the real human being, which is the seat of all these vasanas, samskaras. Physical body is not the seat of these samskaras and vasanas. They can be easily wiped away, but the subtle impressions within are tremendous. They cannot be easily wiped away. They have to be worked out, worked out, or carefully, spiritually treated by which the poisonous effect can go, the evil effects can go. All this will take time. Therefore, they decided that there is need for a re-manifestation in another life where you work out this karma. This goes on till we realize our own real nature, the infinite Atman, ever free, ever pure, without birth and death. That is our true nature. To realize that, we need to pass through these experiences with grahas and atikrahas, life after life. But the end of it is that spiritual knowledge, that realization. There is no way to escape from this need of one's own experience making for one's own realization. Somebody's experience is not my realization. I have to pay for my own experience and achieve my own realization. So, we deal with the subject from that point of view and Yajnavalkya had told this in the course of the discussion that karma, karma, the most important thing is karma. We act and we create a samskara. How difficult to remove a samskara. Take for example what you call habit in your English language. You create a habit. A few actions repeated become a habit. A little longer, if you continue the habit, it is difficult to change it. That habit becomes a law unto you, unto you. You cannot change it at all. Even a small thing called habit is difficult to change. So when the mind takes in impressions, they remain there, they control your actions, your thoughts, your behavior. Unless you purify those samskaras, you can't change your character your behavior in this world. Each person is, has a particular bent, psychological bent. That is made by those samskaras and vasanas that he or she has accumulated in the course of one's life. This is the truth of man, the psychology of the human being. In the West, they did not realize the importance of this samskaras and vasanas till Freud discovered reality of the subconscious and the unconscious. That threw up a tremendous world of knowledge that in this human system there are many forces which are lying low without any activity, just quiet there. When they get an opportunity, they come up into the conscious mind and change your attitudes, actions, etc. The power of the subconscious, underconscious is a tremendous power. That was discovered only a century ago in the West. We studied this very, very early. Mind has layers, surface layer, conscious layer, then pre-conscious, subconscious, unconscious, various layers are there. These layers contain all that you have done, all that you have thought. They are your supreme possession. They are, they are your wealth. They are your asset. They are also your liabilities. If they are good, they are asset. If they are bad, they are your liability, but they belong to you, not to anybody else. That language is the language of Vedanta. We don't throw responsibility on somebody else for anything wrong with us. It is mine. It is mine. In a collective situation, we share our responsibilities. Father and mother, the same family. 
their karmas in the twine and they create what you call changes in each other situation in a society just the same intertwining of various karmas are there but ultimately it is one zone individual karma that one has to handle and with help help also change situation outside by changing the mental attitudes of various people educating the human mind to remove bad impressions create good impressions then you get a good society as well until you change these impressions you don't have a good society otherwise an act of parliament can make all of us good but it doesn't happen you may pass just like now we have the code of conduct for political parties by the election commissioner a big code of conduct a code of conduct it is a code unless i respond to it it is a dead letter in india most codes are dead letters because our own samskaras are not in tune with the code we are selfish we want to break all rules and regulations for our own aggrandizement we have not that citizenship attitude that sense of public responsibility what can code of conduct do so change the ratio of forces in some stars in the human mind then code of conduct can do wonderful work for you otherwise it has very marginal effect only but even a marginal effect is good for our nation when there is so much of indiscipline in the human mind so much of selfish tendency just to appropriate everything to oneself so that is how this subject makes for a human responsibility i am responsible for my own teacher who examined was angry with me he must have failed me therefore quite possible that is the mixed abnormal society in which we live where karma theory operates but in a very very complicated manner the truth is truth karma theory is karma theory whatever you sow that you shall reap the biblical biblical statement that's what karma theory tells us he said it but upanishad is not interested to preach karma theory that is only a theory for improving our ethical behavior the search is for truth but the truth of life but the truth of truth the language you used earlier satyasya satyam the world that you see is true but is there a truth behind it satyasya satyam we are in search of that so that is the main search of the upanishads in the course of it this subject came graha atigraha so the karma theory came what you carry with you in the body dies is this karma this impression that you have created for yourself until you work them out and burn them in the fire of spiritual knowledge you are bound to come and go again and again in this world of graha and atigraha said the upanishads therefore in that section he says put forward the next section deals with a big subject of question and answer and we are now in that section say here they went and talked and found it is all karma karma that's what he says now we come to the other section bondage in the form of the grahas and the atigrahas organs and objects have been described say shankar in his commentary that which together with his cause binds a man so that he transmigrates and freed from which he is liberated is death and liberation from that is possible liberation from this death because there is the death of death he learned it last sunday the liberated man does not go anywhere he is ever free there's no going remember that unliberated person has to go here and there liberated person doesn't go anywhere here itself he is ever free what is unfree has been shed about him the body and the spirit the atman is ever free there is no place to go it is infinite where can it go that's the language the body is an organ of the liberated are for ever discarded those of transmigration take up is it when that is exhausted everything is destroyed save only the name through good work you get good through evil work you get evil the upanishad has said so shankara is telling in that connection is the way in which this must be handled 
by every human being. There is a long discussion in this context because so many schools of thought are there. They throw up various theories and discussing all of them. Upanishad chooses that which finds itself very called with its own great ideas. Shankara is doing that in this particular section. So many various discussions are going on. I do not enter into these detailed discussions. But towards the end, he says, the Shruti, the Upanishads, which contain some of these profound truths about man's spiritual life and his final liberation, they are contained truths, not dogmas. Why? You can question. You can check up. You can try to verify. In that sense, they are called truths. Shruti contains truths of man's spiritual life, his own true nature, our relationship with others, with the ultimate reality. All these are truths which are contained in that literature called the Shruti. Veda means the Shruti, as different from the Smriti, the Purana. They contain rules and regulations given by one person to other persons. They are called Smriti. They can't be questioned. They can be changed also. But Shruti is truth. You can't change it. You only recognize it. As we say, 2 plus 2 is 4. It's not somebody's view. It is the truth of things. 2 plus 2 means 4. Similarly, the spiritual nature of the human being is a truth which has been discovered, which can be discovered by others. Therefore, it is called truth. So, Shruti is the authority on this subject. On all matters of physical nature, science is the authority. Physical science is the authority. Both are authority in one plane or the other. So both are in search of truth, scientific truth, spiritual truth. Shruti speaks of spiritual truth. Now Shankara says here, says the Shrutis have authority only in spiritual matters. The authority in matters which are con contradicted by other means of knowing. As for instance, <coughs> if the Shruti said, fire is cold and wet things, that Shruti has no authority. That is not <coughs> its field. That is the field of physical science. If, however, the passage in the Shruti is ascertained to have the meaning given by the Shruti, then the evidence of the other means of knowledge must be held to be fallacious. That is the truth. <coughs> the inner life. There is a scientific search for the truth there. Outer life. The world weighed by the senses. Scientific search to study that subject. Each is relevant in that particular field. A scientist has no business to say what remains about the truth of man's inner life. He has not studied it. He has not investigated that subject. His subject is sensory data. We believe what we say in that field. But in this field, Shruti is the authority. Anything beyond the senses, that subject is the sphere of the Shruti. Shankara puts it in a beautiful Sanskrit sentence. Atindriya vastu vishaye Shruti deva na pramanam In all Atindriya vastu Transcendental facts. The only authority is Shruti and not sub-physical science. Ati Indriya Vishaya. But Indriya Vishaya, Shruti has no authority. Shruti is not there to say about this and that. If at all those who say so, take it as merely suggestions. Our main authority will be physical science. Even in this text, we will find a little later the text saying, that beyond the solar system is the earth. Earth is bigger than the solar system. The statements are there. That is take, to be taken as merely a suggestion. They are not sanctioned by the Shruti, because Shruti deals with only transcendental realities above the sensory level. So he says, perception of the ignorant can be various. The sky is blue. The sky is dirty, our senses tell us, but it is not really so. It is only an impression, that is all. 
the investigation reveals the truth of things. Similarly, the investigation into the nature of the human being led them to this great truth that this small, finite human being is truly infinite in dimension, as a depth dimension. Outwardly, he looks very small, very ordinary. That is the truth about the human being, which was compressed in a small statement, which I have often recited here, the Chandogya Upanishad, Tattumasi, Tattumasi, you are that, you are that. That is authority of the Shruti, like any other science. The science of spirituality is a science. Science of physical nature is a science. Both are science. One is called sensory level science, the other is above the sensory level science or transcendental science. Loka, Lokottara, two technical words. Loka, sensory level. Lokottara is the transcendental, above the sensory level. And so, the sun does not cease to reveal objects because of the ingenuity of the human mind. Similarly, the Vedic passages cannot be made to give up their meaning. Therefore, therefore it is proved that work does not lead to liberation. These various samskaras and vasanas, they have to be worked out. Rather, they have to be burned in the fire of knowledge. The Gita refers to the fire of knowledge. Jnana indhana. Indhana means the, what you call, wood or a piece of wood. Jnana is the fire. You burn indhana in that fire. Jnana agni and karma indhana. These are merely wood to be burned in the fire of jnana. This language is used in the Gita. So here also, it is the jnana, my true nature. That knowledge can burn away all these impurities, all these samskaras and vasanas referred to as karma. At the end, in the next verse, the question arises as number one in this section. Atahayinam bhujur yahyayani papracha yajnalakedi hovacha matreshu charaka pariparjama te patanjalasya kapyasya grihanayama tasya asi duhita gandharva grihita tam apruchama kositi so bravit sudhanvan angirasa iti tam yada lokanam anta napruchama athayinam apruma ko parikshita bhavan niti ko parikshita bhavan sattva prachami yajyavalkya ko parikshita bhavan niti little story is being told at this time the question by bhujju of lakhyayana yes bhujju the grandson of lakhya is lakhyayana then bhujju the grandson of lakhya asked him yajyavalkya the story is very interesting yajyavalkya we traveled in madra as students, some of the areas, probably of the East Punjab area, Madhudesha, Madri's place, or that is the Kaurava uh, uh, wife, Madri, uh, Kunti and Madri. Madri's place somewhere in that area. Madra. We went there as students and we came to the house of Patanjala, of the line of Kapi. His daughter was as possessed by a Grindharva, some fit suffering from some fit and some sort of possession. His daughter was possessed by Gandharva. We asked him, Who are you? He said, I am Sudhanvan of the line of Angiras. That Gandharva who possessed him answered like this, I am Sudhanvan of the line of Angiras. When we asked him about the limits of this world, yes, we said to him, where were the descendants of Parikshit? We ask this question. And I ask you, Yajnavalkya, where were the descendants of Parikshit? Tell me, where were the descendants of Parikshit? So, Bhujyu got up to ask Yajnavalkya this question. Before asking, he told this story. This happened. I know something. I want to know whether you know it or not. And he says, so in this question, the answer is very, very ordinary not highly philosophical, says the, where were the descendants of Parikshit? And Gandharva told us all about it. So I have been instructed by a celestial being and you do not have that knowledge. Hence you are defeated in argument. That's the good use way of putting it. 
This is the idea. Being possessed of this revealed knowledge from the Gandharva, I ask you, Yajyavalkya, where were the descendants of Parikshit? Do you know this? Tell me. I ask you, where were the descendants of Yajyavalkya? Yajyavalkya answer. That answer contains some of these ideas which is not accepted by today's knowledge of cosmology. The Gandharva evidently told you that they went where the performers of the horse sacrifice go. That is, Ashwamedha takes you to a particular region. There they went there, purely in the context of Vedic theology, they are ritualistic theology. Gandharva say, air, they praise the air. Air means prana, that energy that runs throughout the universe. That is called prana. That is ultimately the main thing. All these are merely manifestations of that prana. Therefore, the air, that is the prana, is the diversity of individuals. Air is the aggregate. Air is individual. Air is also to total, the universal and the particular. He who knows it as such conquers for the death. With this answer, thereupon, Rujyu, grandson of Lakya, kept silent. He was satisfied with that particular answer or all detailed cosmology of that time, which is not in tune with present-day cosmology. Therefore, it is not of much interest to us. But the question is that this idea of prana, the reality of energy at the essence of this universe, all this material universe essentially is a dance of energy. That much is the truth that we can take out of this kind of statements. So, that is the question that was asked. Now comes the real question for which Upanishad is famous, asking a deeper question. This. It has been stated, Shankara says in his introduction to this section 4, that a man under the control of the organs and objects, graha and arikraha, which are themselves directed by his merits and demerits, punya and papa, repeatedly takes up and discards the organs and objects and transmigrates. In this birth, I have a particular organ, a particular object to enjoy. Another birth, a similar one, another one. All this is directed by the effect of karma that is within me. The perfection of merits has been explained as being concerned. To teach about the self, he says, now the question arises as to whether the entity that transmigrates that little sokshma sharira, subtle body that transmigrates, does it exist or does it not exist? That is the main question all over the world. When a man dies, is there anything left over or everything is over about him? That is a very important question. All over the world this has been debated. In the Upanishads, you get a very profound insight into this subject. Many of the materialistic scientists, when they begin to think seriously on the question, they like to know, what will happen to me when I die? Do I continue? That question comes again and again. Though I don't believe in all this, I'm an agnostic. But a question comes again and again. When Sir J.C. Bose spoke at a scientific meeting years ago to demonstrate what he called sensitiveness in plants and metals, at the end of the lecture, my metallurgist asked him this question. Mr. Bose, tell me this. I am an atheist, but do I exist after death? That question is constantly pressing upon the human mind. And here also, you are coming to that. In the Kathopanishad, that was the main question asked by Nachiketa to Yama. And Yama offered him three boons because the boy was not taken care of when he came to Yama's house. He was away at that time. He was very sorry when he returned. Such a beautiful young person. Nobody cared for him. I am very sorry for it, he said. And as a penance, I offer you three, three boons. One boon for each night. You stayed here unattended. That's how the cutoff begins. First two boons, Nachikita used for ordinary purposes. Last boon he kept firmly in his hand. And he said, you ask the third boon. Nachikita said, Yama, I have this doubt. When a person dies, some say he exists, some say he does not. I want to know the truth as taught by you. What do you say on the question? It's a beautiful formulation. Eyam prete vijigitsa manushe 
ಅಸ್ತಿತ್ಯೇಕೇ ನಾಯನಸ್ತೀತಿ ಚೇಕೆ ಸಂಸೆ ಅಸ್ತಿ ಸಂಸೆ ನಾಸ್ತಿ ಏತತ್ ವಿದ್ಯಾನ್ ಅನಿಶಿಷ್ಟಸ್ತಯ ಟಾಟ್ ಬೈ ಯು ಐ ವುಡ್ ಲೈಕ್ ಟು ನೋ ದಿಸ್ ಟ್ರೂತ್ ಪರಾಣ ಏಷ ವರ ಸ್ತೃತೀಯ ದಿಸ್ ಇಸ್ ಮೈ ಸುಪ್ರೀಂ ಥರ್ಡ್ ಬೂನ್ ದ ಲಾಸ್ಟ್ ಬೂನ್ ವಿಚ್ ವಿ ಆರ್ ಗಿವನ್ ಆರ್ ಸೀಕ್ರೆಟ್ಲಿ ಕೆಪ್ಟಿಲ್ ನೌ ಐ ಆಮ್ ನೌ ಪ್ಲೇಸಿಂಗ್ ಇನ್ ಬಿಫೋರ್ ಯು ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಉಪನಿಷ ಟೆಲ್ಸ್ ಯು ಯಮಾ ವಾಸ್ ಶಾಕ್ಟ್ ವಾಟ್ ಅ ಟೈನಿ ಬಾಯ್ ಆಸ್ಕಿಂಗ್ ಸಚ್ ಎ ಪರ್ಫಾವನ್ ಕ್ವೆಶ್ಚನ್ ವಾಟ್ ಆಸ್ ಯು ಡು ವಿತ್ ದ ಕ್ವೆಶನ್ ಆಫ್ ಡೆತ್ ಸೊ ಹಿ ಸೇಸ್ ಯು ಆರ್ ಎ ಬಾಯ್ ಯು ವಾಂಟ್ ಓನ್ಲಿ ಪ್ಲೇ ಥಿಂಗ್ಸ್ ಐ ವಿಲ್ ಗಿವ್ ಯು ಪ್ಲೆಂಟಿ ಆಫ್ ದ ಪ್ಲೆಷರ್ ಕಂಫರ್ಟ್ ಮನಿ ಎವ್ರಿಥಿಂಗ್ ಐ ಗಿವ್ ಯು ಡೋಂಟ್ ಆಸ್ಕ್ ಮೀ ದಿಸ್ ಕ್ವೆಶನ್ ಬಟ್ ಎ ಬಾಯ್ ವಾಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಎ ಡಿಫರೆಂಟ್ ಟೈಪ್ ಹಿ ಸೆಡ್ ಯು ಸೀನ್ ಟು ಬಿ ಫ್ಯಾಸಿನೇಟೆಡ್ ಬೈ ದೀಸ್ ಥಿಂಗ್ಸ್ ಯು ವಾಂಟ್ ಆಫರ್ ಟು ದಮ್ ಟು ಮೀ ಯು ಟೇಕ್ ದಮ್ ಯುವರ್ ಸೆಲ್ಫ್ ಐ ವಾಂಟ್ ಓನ್ಲಿ ಆನ್ಸರ್ ಟು ದಿಸ್ ಕ್ವೆಶನ್ ಐ ಡೋಂಟ್ ವಾಂಟ್ ಎನಿಥಿಂಗ್ ಎಲ್ಸ್ ನಾಣ್ಯಂ ತಸ್ಮಾತ್ ನಚಿಕೇತ ಪ್ರಣೀತೆ ದಿಸ್ ನಚಿಕೇತ ವಿಲ್ ನಾಟ್ ಆಸ್ ಫಾರ್ ಎನಿ ಅದರ್ ಬೂನ್ ಎಕ್ಸೆಪ್ಟ್ ದಿಸ್ ಪ್ರಫಾವನ್ ಕ್ವೆಶನ್ ದಟ್ ಅಜಿಟೇಟ್ಸ್ ಎವ್ರಿ ಹ್ಯೂಮನ್ ಮೈಂಡ್ ಸಮ್ ಟೈಮ್ ಆರ್ ದಿ ಅದರ್ ಯಮ ವಾಸ್ ಇಮೆನ್ಸ್ಲಿ ಇಂಪ್ರೆಸ್ಡ್ ವಾಟ್ ಎ ವಂಡರ್ಫುಲ್ ಸ್ಟೂಡೆಂಟ್ ಹಿ ಈಸ್ ದ ಫಿಟೆಸ್ಟ್ ಸ್ಟೂಡೆಂಟ್ ಟು ಅಂಡರ್ಸ್ಟ್ಯಾಂಡ್ ದಿಸ್ ಟ್ರೂತ್ ಇಸ್ ಮೈಂಡ್ ಈಸ್ ಫರ್ಮ್ ದ ಡೋರ್ ಈಸ್ ಓಪನ್ ಟು ನಜಿಕೇತ ಟು ಎಂಟರ್ ಇನ್ ದ ವರ್ಲ್ಡ್ ಆಫ್ ಟ್ರೂತ್ ನಚಿಕೇತ ಯಮ ಇಸ್ ಪ್ರೇಸಿಂಗ್ ನಚಿಕೇತ ಇಸ್ ಸತ್ಯ ಧೃತಪಥಾಸಿ ಯು ಆರ್ ಫರ್ಮ್ ಇನ್ ಯುವರ್ ಪರ್ಸ್ಯೂಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಟ್ರೂತ್ ನನ್ ಆಫ್ ದೀಸ್ ಅಲ್ಯೂರ್ಮೆಂಟ್ಸ್ ಫಾರ್ ಶೇಕ್ ಯುವರ್ ವೇ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಯುವರ್ ಪರ್ಸ್ಯೂಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಟ್ರೂತ್ ದೇರ್ ಫೋರ್ ಯಮ ಸೆಟ್ ತು ಅದೃನ್ನೋ ಭೂಯಾತ್ ನಚಿಕೇತ ಪ್ರಶ್ನ ಮೇ ಬಿ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಮೋರ್ ಸ್ಟೂಡೆಂಟ್ಸ್ ಲೈಕ್ ಯೂ ಕ್ವೆಶ್ಚನಿಂಗ್ ಮೈಂಡ್ ಫುಲ್ ಆಫ್ ಫರ್ಮ್ ಬಿಲೀಫ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಅಲ್ಟಿಮೇಟ್ ಟ್ರೂತ್ ಐ ವಾಂಟ್ ಸಚ್ ಕ್ವೆಶ್ಚನರ್ಸ್ ಮೋರ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಮೋರ್ ಯು ಗೆಟ್ ಇನ್ ದಿ ಸೆಕೆಂಡ್ ಚಾಪ್ಟರ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ದ ಹೋಲ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಉಪನಿಷತ್ ಇನ್ ಅನ್ ಎಕ್ಸ್ಪೋಸಿಷನ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿಸ್ ಸಬ್ಜೆಕ್ಟ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿ ಇಂಪೆರಿಷಬಲ್ ಬಿಹೈಂಡ್ ದ ಪೆರಿಷಬಲ್ ಡೆತ್ ಬಿಲಾಂಗ್ಸ್ ಓನ್ಲಿ ಟು ದ ಬಾಡಿ ಡೆತ್ ಬಿಲಾಂಗ್ಸ್ ಓನ್ಲಿ ಟು ದಿ ಆಬ್ಜೆಕ್ಟ್ ಆಬ್ಜೆಕ್ಟ್ಸ್ ಕಮ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಗೋ ಇಟರ್ನಲ್ ಸಬ್ಜೆಕ್ಟ್ ಈಸ್ ಆಲ್ವೇ ದ ಸಬ್ಜೆಕ್ಟ್ ನೆವರ್ ದಿ ಆಬ್ಜೆಕ್ಟ್ ನಾವು ದಿಸ್ ಅಂಡರ್ಫುಲ್ ಟೀಚಿಂಗ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಕಠೋ ಉಪನಿಷತ್ ಟು ಅಟ್ ದಿ ಎಂಡ್ ಉಪನಿಷತ್ ಸೆಲ್ ನಜಿಕೇತ ಫಾಲೋಡ್ ದ ಟೀಚಿಂಗ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಯಮ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ರಿಯಲೈಸ್ಡ್ ದಿ ಮಾರ್ಟಲ್ ವೈ ಲಿವಿಂಗ್ ಇಟ್ ಸೆಲ್ಫ್ ದ ಬಾಡಿ ಅಲೋನ್ ಈಸ್ ಮಾರ್ಟಲ್ ದ ಆತ್ಮನ್ ಇಸ್ ಎವರ್ ಇ ಮಾರ್ಟಲ್ ಈವನ್ ದ ಲಿವಿಂಗ್ ದ ಬಾಡಿ ರಿಯಲೈಸ್ ಐ ಆಮ್ ದಟ್ ಇ ಮಾರ್ಟಲ್ ಸೆಲ್ಫ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಅದರ್ಸ್ ಆಲ್ಸೋ ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ರಿಯಲೈಸ್ ದಿಸ್ ಟೂ ದ ಉಪನಿಷತ್ ಕನ್ಕ್ಲೂಡ್ಸ್ ಅನ್ಯೋಪ್ಯವಂ ಯು ವಿತ್ ಅಧ್ಯಾತ್ಮೇವಂ ಅದರ್ಸ್ ಆಲ್ಸೋ ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಟ್ರೈ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ರಿಯಲೈಸ್ ದಿಸ್ ಟ್ರೂ ಆಫ್ ದಿ ಮಾರ್ಟಲ್ ಬಿಹೈಂಡ್ ದ ಮಾರ್ಟಲ್ ದಿಸ್ ಇಸ್ ಅ ರೆಕರಿಂಗ್ ಥೀಮ್ ಥ್ರೂಔಟ್ ಅವರ್ ಹಿಸ್ಟರಿ ಎ ರಾಷನಲ್ ಅಪ್ರೋಚ್ ಎಕ್ಸ್ಪೀರಿಯನ್ಷಿಯಲ್ ಅಪ್ರೋಚ್ ಟು ದಿಸ್ ಗ್ರೇಟ್ ಸಬ್ಜೆಕ್ಟ್ ಐ ಕೋಟ್ ಎಟ್ ಮಹಾಭಾರತ ವರ್ಡ್ಸ್ ಸೆವರಲ್ ಟೈಮ್ಸ್ ಇಯರ್ ಇನ್ ದಿಸ್ ಹ್ಯೂಮನ್ ಬಾಡಿ ದೇರ್ ಆರ್ ಟೂ ಡೇಟ ಡೇಟಾ ಅಮೃತಶ್ಚೈವ ಮೃತ್ಯುಶ್ಚ ದ್ವಯಂ ದೇಹೇ ಪ್ರತಿಷ್ಠಿತ ವಿತ್ ಇನ್ ದಿಸ್ ಹ್ಯೂಮನ್ ಬಾಡಿ ಟೂ ಡೇಟಾ ಆರ್ ಎವರ್ ಪ್ರೆಸೆಂಟ್ ಒನ್ ಇಸ್ ಅಮೃತ ದಿ ಅದರ್ ಇಸ್ ಮೃತ ಒನ್ ಇಸ್ ಇನ್ ಮಾರ್ಟಾಲಿಟಿ ದಿ ಅದರ್ ಇಸ್ ಡೆತ್ ಬೋತ್ ಆರ್ ದೇ ವಿತ್ ಇನ್ ದಿ ಸಿಸ್ಟಮ್ ದಟ್ ಇಸ್ ಹೌ ಡು ಯು ಗೆಟ್ ಇನ್ ಮಾರ್ಟಾಲಿಟಿ ಹೌ ಡು ಯು ಕಮ್ ಟು ಮಾರ್ಟಾಲಿಟಿ ಸೇಸ್ ಬ
if one knows it as unconditioned, naturally free from action and its factors and results, one is freed from the above mentioned bondage together with its stimulating causes. Atikraha, graha, you get complete freedom from them when you realize the unconditioned nature of the infinite Atman, which is one's own nature. But is there such an Atman? That is the truth Upanishads took up 4,000 years ago. The answers have a tremendous value for the world of today. And that is why Upanishads are studied by great scientists, biology, physics, all these cosmologists. They study the subject with great interest. Now, the question. Adaha, Ayanam, Ushastha, Chakrayana, Papracha. Then Ushastha, the son of Chakra, asked Yajnavalkya one question. Yajnavalkya, explain to me the Brahman that is immediate and direct, the self that is within all. The most beautiful formulation of this question. Yat Sakshat, Aparokshat, Brahma, Ya Atma Sarvantaraha, Tamme Vyachakshwa. That is the question of this Pushastha. Now, in religion, when you study evolution of religion, a tribal religion, they believe some god somewhere, some power, which can do all these tricks and wonders here. Slowly, we keep it beyond this universe, extra cosmic. In all the organized religions, Christianity, Islam, and Judaism, Semitic religions particularly, an extra cosmic god is there. Not at all part of this nature. The nature is only his own willpower. It has come that sort. But he is extra cosmic. Therefore, he is something supernatural. The extra cosmic god is something supernatural. Anything connected with religion is supernatural in all such systems. So what is that god? You can't question him. That is what supernaturalism insists. Don't question. But why not? We can question. After 100 or 2000 years, people started questioning in the modern period. Is there such a God? How do you know he is there? It's a figment of the imagination. Imagine there is a God there. You suppose it is there. You presume it is there. You posit it is there. It may be there. It may not be there. Theology collapses in no time. That's why in America they wrote 10 page article in the Time magazine. God is dead. Big article. God is dead. Even Khrushchev said in one lecture, people believe in some God far away in the sky. We sent up our astronauts. They reported there is nobody there. <laughs> the way in which the subject has been treated in the modern period. Why? Because it is just a dogma. Just a presumption. And we call him by Allah or Yehovah. Any name you can use. We had used many names. Indra, Mitra, various names we had used in the Vedas. In the Upanishads, something wonderful you find. Questioning all these assumptions. In no other literature you will find. Take any religious book, you won't find it. But only here, the sages question these assumptions. How do you know there is Brahman there? You have no experience of it. Nobody has experienced it. It is just there, that's all. You simply fear and tremble in his name. What a superstition it is. So, an extra cosmic God has no validity except belief. But today we want to question. Why should I merely believe? Is there such a God? Therefore, you come to the Upanishads where these investigations were carried on by brilliant minds, not ordinary minds. Is that belief true? Anybody can believe but is the belief true? True belief. That's what makes for science. A belief that can be subjected to investigation. That becomes a true belief. Science wants a set of true beliefs. So here also, in the Upanishad, the question was asked, is the idea of God true? Can you demonstrate the truth of it? That is how you are slowly coming to that kind of...